takes me a while to get set up. First thing I need to do is get things my height. You know, in the book, The Tale of Two Cities, written by um, Charles Dixon, Dickens, in the first chapter, the first line, he says, um, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. And he describes that there's two cities, Paris and London, and the difficult times and the good times that they're in before and during the French Revolution. Now, if Dickens was going to write something about the book of Judges, in the first chapter and the first line, he would say, it's the worst of times. Uh, it is really a bad time. Um, if you think about it, it was only a, a generation or maybe even two before when Joshua, the commander-in-chief of the Lord's army and the commander-in-chief of, um, of the 12 tribes comes and they enter into the promised land. And it's, it's, it's a time of conquest that they're going to take over the whole land for the purpose of having a place where the Israelites can worship, be holy, and be priests in that context to shine out to the whole world the glory of God. And it was a, a victorious time when Joshua came in. And you know, some of the tw 12 tribes did a good job in kicking out the people who were already there so they could possess, uh, possess it for the Lord. But some of the 12 tribes didn't do a very good job. In fact, if you look at the map um, on the screen, you'll see that... Um, You'll see there's the Philistines down there on the left on the beach. And right above the Philistine is the tribe of Dan. And Dan has the responsibility of kicking out the Philistines. And they didn't do a very good job. In fact, uh, they did a lousy job. In fact, if you look in the book of Revelation, and you read the book of Revelation, sometimes it lists the 12 tribes. You won't even see the, the tribe of Dan listed. Either they were swallowed up by the Philistines or they, were, or they left that area and they went somewhere else and they're not even listed anymore. So, so they did a pretty, pretty lousy job of kicking out the Philistines. And that was a hard order because the Philistines were very recalcitrant and they weren't going to be kicked out by anybody. They were going to fight till the death. If you look at this map, in fact, the Philistine nation grows when the tribes come in and they start to be the adversaries and they start to be the people who are going to swallow up the 12 tribes. I mean, they encroach on Judah. They encroach on other areas of the 12 tribes. And the Philistines are a huge force at this time. And for the Israelites, it's the worst of times. It's not easy at all. If you look at the next map, you'll see that there's five cities down there with red dots. Those five cities were the mega complex of the Philistines. That, that, that was the governing power. And you look at the map and it's all green. It's on the Negev. That's the breadbasket of Israel. Lots of crops, lots of grain, olive groves, orchards, all kinds of things are in that area. That's where you fed. So you have these five cities. They're controlling the market. They're controlling all the produce and all the land. And they can tax the fruit when it goes into the tribes of Israel. Put a high tax on it, make more money. So they're in charge of all the commerce. They're in charge of probably all the government around there. And the cities that are in that area are ruled in the way that the Philistines rule. They're governed and it's like they're not only the provider of the whole area, but they're the protector and they're the judge of the whole area. And then they worship Dagon. Dagon, the false god. And uh, they give him the credit for all that the Philistines are doing. And they are encroaching upon uh, the Judea people, the Israelite people, and the Israelite people are being ruled by them. It's the worst of times. 
it's very dif difficult. So what does God do? He does what he always does. He cares for his kids. And when he cares for his kids, he sends somebody to help. And he sends Samson. We've heard all the stories about Samson. That Samson is God's choice, and he's God's choice to deliver Dan and Judah and these tribes from the Philistines because the Philistines have their boot on the neck of Israel at this time, and they need to have a deliverer. If you look at this slide, we all think Samson, uh, the, the one with the apples, please, we all think Samson is a hypocritical billboard. Uh, in his body, we look at him and he's a man of God. Uh, but you look inside of him and he's telling us just the opposite. He's like this slide. He's, he's this conflicting person, this hypocritical billboard. Uh, his body tells you one thing, but his actions and his mouth and his anger tell you just the opposite. We think that um, Samson is this big guy. Uh, next slide, please. See that he's taller, uh, that he's stronger, that he's, he's bigger than anybody, and he can just break ropes because he's huge. The text doesn't say that. The text tells you that Goliath is a giant. Uh, the text tells you that Saul is head and shoulders over everybody. The text tells you that Rebecca's beautiful and Rachel's beautiful. The text doesn't say anything about Samson. I think Samson's an average guy. He's, uh, he's probably 5'7 and 175 pounds, just like Lynn. Uh, that's, that's who he's like. He's, he's not this guy as tall as I am with muscles out the, out the wazoo. He's not that way at all. But when you look at him on the slide there, you know he's a Nazarite dedicated to God because that's what his body tells you. Look at his hair. Look at his beard. He's made a vow from birth by his parents that he's going to walk in the way of the Lord every day of his life. He's going to be a godly man. Not going to touch, touch dead things. Not going to eat grapes. Not going to drink wine. He's, he's going to obey his, his parents. He's going to be calm. He's not going to lose his temper and rage. And, and Samson does all of those things he's not supposed to do. He throws them out as if they're not even that important. But there's one thing we have to ask. Why does God choose Samson? This hip hypocrite. This guy that has two stories conflicting in his life. Why does he choose him? I think first and foremost, he chooses Samson because he knows that Samson believes in him, that he has an unshakable faith in God. He was raised from the moment he could listen up to this point that he's not an uncircumcised Philistine. You can go... He is, he is devoted to God. He's a person of the covenant. God has brought him in by circumcision, but also by his, his, his birth into the Jewish faith that he, he is a server of Yahweh. He's not a server of any other false pagan god like Dagon. That's not it at all for him. And that is core to Samson. You cut him down the deepest part of his life. And what runs out? Yahweh. And that's why he chose him. God chose him because he had an unshakable faith. And you know, he chose him because he's a fighter. And he doesn't stop fighting. It's interesting, you look at Hebrews chapter 11, and it says in verse 32, time will fail me if I tell of uh, Barak, if I tell of, if, of Gideon, 
if I tell of Jephthah, if I tell of Samson, and if I speak of David and Samuel and the prophets. And then he, he goes on, the writer of Hebrews goes on and he says, uh, uh, these guys and others uh, shut the mouths of lions and performed acts of righteousness and quenched the power of fire and, 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 and all the, the sword and all these things. And then he says, of these men, the world is not worthy. And Samson's in that list. And he's in that list because he has a faith that doesn't move. You, you touch him about his faith, and he believes in Yahweh. He throws out everything else, but that's a core belief for him, and that's important. You look at this target here, and you can see that's Samson right there. His core belief is Yahweh is my God. But he doesn't have a Christian worldview or a Judeo um, uh, worldview. He has a Philistine worldview. Uh, he has carnal values. He has carnal behaviors. He's a hypocrite, just like you and I sometimes. I feel like this picture describes me at times. I'm going to die for Jesus. I've made that. I have to fight for Jesus, I'm going to fight for him. That's, that's inside of me. That's hallowed ground. I'm not going to move from that. But sometimes I have a pagan worldview. I act just like Americans. I, I don't live the way I should. I, I have carnal values at times. I, I have carnal behaviors at times. Isn't this all, all of us here? And... And this is, this is Samson. And, um, you know, you read these chapters in chapter 14 to, to 16, and the first thing you think, it's, it's all about the women. It's all about the women. Look at him. He's a womanizer. He's a, he's a sex addict. That guy is just living by his glands. He has no control. And it's true. But it isn't about the women in this text. The women are like couriers in this text from 14 to 16. They take Samson from where he is and they put him in a place of where he needs to be in order that he can have a confrontation with the Philistines. But more than that, that he can have a confrontation because he represents God and the confrontation is against Dagon, the god of the Philipp Philistines. And the women are just the ones that bring him into the point where this confrontation takes place. So it's, it's, it's not about the women at all. Um, it's kind of tit for tat at first. Uh, Samson slaps them on the right cheek and they slap back on the left and it goes back and forth. But these aren't just little slaps. I mean, these are blows. Um, in, in Italy, if I say, uh, for Connie, I say, she's pretty, a bella. If I say she's beautiful, a bellissima. If I say, I have a hand, mano. If I have a big hand, I have a manone. Well, this isn't just tit for tat. This is titone versus tatone. I mean, these are big confrontations. Every time there's a confrontation here in Judges six, uh, 14 to 16, they're huge. And they're not only on the level of humans, but they're on the spiritual level. Gene Sealander spoke a wonderful message last Sunday he, he spoke on the plane of the human plane. I'm going to take you higher, Lord willing, and speak on the spiritual plane because both stories need to be told. And praise God we can tell them and have the time to do that. So if you look at Judges chapter 14, 1 through 4, it says, Then Samson went down to Timnah, 
and saw a woman, a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. So he came back and he told his father and his mother, I saw a woman in Timnah, one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now get her for me as a wife. Then his father and his mother said to him, Is there no woman among you, among the daughters of your relatives, or among our people, that you have to go down and take a wife from these uncircumcised Philistines, people that are not in the covenant? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She looks good to me. However, his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, for he was seeking an occasion against the Philistines. Now at that time, the Philistines were ruling over Samson. So here we have this three-act play. And uh, the, the play starts, and the curtains come open, and the first thing we see on uh, the stage and on, on the platform is this beautiful, probably sexy little Tim Knight girl. Uh, she's probably, oh, 17 to 20 in that range. Samson's probably 20 to 25 in that range, and, and their hormones are going nuts. And, uh, and Samson wants a girl, and he sees this one, and he wants her. And uh, he puts pressure on his parents. They don't want this at all. This isn't biblical in their minds. And he forces them, and, and they both go down with Samson, and they set up a marriage contract. And it's an arranged marriage, not willingly. And then there's seven days of feasting. And uh, because Samson's a foreigner, the, the fiancé invites 30 Philistine men. She probably invites more than that. She probably invites 30 Philistine women, but the text just says men. And there's the family there, and it's going to be a seven-day party, and on the seventh day there's going to be this wedding. And it's just a beautiful time. And uh, um, they get together, and uh, they're drinking, and they're eating. They're probably getting drunk sometimes. They're Philistines. It's in the middle of the, of the vineyards, and wine is flowing. It's a wine culture, and they're drinking, and it, they're, they're getting loose. And, and there's seven days of all this, and there's seven days of dead time. What do you do when you've eaten enough and you've drunk enough? Well, in America, you'd get out your phones, or you'd watch Netflix. Or you'd listen to Pandora music and you'd have a dance. Well, you know, they don't have any of that. So usually somebody comes up with a game. Well, Samson comes up with a riddle. Good idea. And it's a creative riddle. But he does some stupid things. Really stupid. One, when you're in a foreign culture, you learn that you never cause the face to be shamed of the culture that you're in. You always have to save face. So he's with these 30 Philistine men. They're checking him out. They don't know if he's a good guy or a bad guy. He's a Jew. How can we trust him? Those Jews have taken our land. And so there's already tension in the, in the mood here. And uh, he, he puts this riddle there. and That's a good idea. And but, you know, they're never going to be able to solve that riddle. You know why? Because he's thinking of the riddle in a Hebrew head. And he's using Hebrew poetry and Hebrew language. And, and the hardest thing to do to learn a language is to learn humor. That's why we say we don't understand British humor. Because we don't understand the British mind. That's why we don't understand British humor or any kind of humor. And we don't understand their poetry. Don't, we don't understand their riddles. And he gives them a riddle in a Hebrew head. And they're never going to answer that riddle. It's impossible. So that's stupid. And the other thing that's stupid is that he puts a wager on it. You solve the riddle, I'll give you 30 suits of clothes. Now, we're not talking about uh, 100, uh, 30 t-shirts from Walmart that might cost you 200 bucks. 
Each suit of clothes is hand tailored, has special clothing in it, has special um, pieces of metal sometimes and gemstones and these are wedding attire clothes. These are tuxedos. These are formal attire that they're supposed to give if they lose the bet and Samson's supposed to give if the Philistines win the bet. And so it's a high stakes game here. We're talking thousands of dollars a bet. It's not just a $5 bet here. And, and, and the tension's rising. And right, what does the text say? From day one of the seven days of fast, of uh, feasting, the fiancé of uh, Samson's crying. I mean, you're crying right when you're getting married? What's going on here? She's crying because she knows that her people have been shamed. And if it keeps going that way, it's going to be horrific. And she's crying every day to Samson, tell me this riddle. Do you love me? Do you care for me? Tell me this riddle. I got I to gotta know this riddle. And he goes, I haven't even told my parents. Why should I tell you? And, and he, he's, he doesn't understand. He's clueless. And she understands this is a shame honor thing. After the fourth day, what happens? 30 men come to Samson, uh, come to the fiance, and they say, you better find out that riddle or we're going to kill you. I mean, it's high stakes here. You don't tell us the riddle. We're going to burn your house down with you and your dad inside. And it is a violent confrontation here. And so finally, after he's been worn, nagged, whined to death, he, he gives up and tells her the riddle. Instantly, what does she do? She runs to the Philistines. She tells him, ah, oh, the pressure's off. Instantly, the Philistines run back to Samson, tell him the answer. Ah, oh, the pressure's off. What happens to uh, Samson? He goes ballistic. His anger turns into pure rage. He is so angry, he can't stand it. He goes to one of the major cities, Ascalon. He kills 30 Philistines. They're probably dressed in their suits. And he gets the suits and he takes them back to the 30 Philistines at the wedding. Now that's not, that's a shameful thing because when you give a, a suit, you should give a new suit. So he's kind of dishonoring them, but he's saying, here, here's your suits. Uh, smell a little bad, a, a little scratched. Uh, ooh, has a spot of spaghetti right here. Uh, not a, but it's all right, here's your suit. And, and so the tension's rising. That, it's right on the wedding day. It's the seventh day. It's right at the I do phase. And this happens. Uh, Samson leaves the wedding party for a little bit. He comes back. He's killed 30 men. He, he gives the clothes to them. And, and uh, he's so angry, he leaves the wedding fest. He doesn't even wait for the I do part. He's gone. Goes back home. What does the father-in-law do? The father-in-law gives his bride to Samson's best man. Oh, that's convenient. And so there's no shame involved here. And, and uh, the fiancé now has a best man, probably a Philistine guy. We don't know. After about several days, Samson rethinks, oh, she was a nice-looking girl, a sexy girl. I, I want her. So he brings back a goat to her, a little peace offering, and he wants everything to happen really good and finds out my wife has been given away to my best man. I don't have a wife anymore. And it says in a text that there's a slaughter. We don't know what that means. It means that Samson was probably killing quite a bit of people. And uh, he is just a little bit frustrated. And then after that, he goes, and he, he goes out into the, to the fields and he captures these jackals. It says in your Bible, they're foxes. But they're not foxes, because foxes are too independent, they're too small, um, they would never cooperate anyway. Uh, but he gets these jackals, and jackals rove around in packs. And, and there's a lot of them in the Middle East. They're all over the place, and they're a little bigger. bigger. He gets 150 pairs, and he takes one pair. It's got to be a miracle by God, because how could you do this on your own? He takes one pair, he ties their tails together. I don't know 
how they didn't bite the living daylights out of his hands, but the text doesn't say he had supernatural power, and he puts a torch in between the tails, and uh, he lights it. Well, that's right by their, um, their private parts, the jackal's parts. So you could tell that they're kind of excited. They have flames right there. What are you going to do? Man, they hop around all over the place. They're skitzing over here. They're scatching over there. And, and they're, let, they're lighting everything on fire. It's the grain harvest. The wheat's dry. Uh, fire hits that wheat. It just goes over like it's a bomb. Uh, olive trees. We lived in an olive tree area in Rome. And they're dry trees. And there's a lot of grass around. And it's like a bomb. It's, it's, it's like a, just like a, a big bomb fire that goes off. And the whole area is burnt to a crisp. I mean, it's, 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 it's amazing. The subliminal idea here is that Dagon, the god of the Philistines, comes from the root Dagon, which means grain. And Dagon is the god of grain and the god of produce and the God of abundance. And they're in the breadbasket of this area. And Dagon has been lifted up as the great provider of the Philistine people. And God uses one man with unshakable faith, powered by his spirit, to do a ridiculous act with jackals and torches. And in one afternoon, burns the whole place down. And the subliminal message that shouts loud, Who is your provider, Israel? Is it Dagon? Who can be, with, be beat with one man filled with God and jackals? Or is it the God of Yahweh? And the curtain closes on Act one, 1. And it's ringing in the households of the Israelites all throughout the region. We may be trusting in the wrong God here. We need to be trusting in Yahweh. We've lost our sight. We're going the wrong way. We, we, we may, we may be need, need, needing to turn around. And they're thinking about that. And then we go to Acts, Acts chap, Act 2 of the play. And in Act 2 of the play, we see, um, we see that the woman isn't in the first part of the play in Act 2. She comes at the very end of it. Um, and so we look at the, uh, Judges chapter 15, 6. And this is after the whole place has been burned down. And uh, the Philistines come and they go, who did this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because the father-in-law took his, uh, Samson's wife and gave her to his companion, his best man. So the Philistines came and, and burned her and her father with fire. I mean, this is, uh, this is serious here. And Samson said to them, Since you act like this, I will surely take revenge on you. And after that, I'll quit. So it's this tit for tat. And he struck them ruthlessly with a great slaughter. And he went down and lived in a cleft of the rock of Edom. Then the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and spread out in Lehi. Lehi means jawbone. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? And they said, we have come up to bind you in order to do to him as he has done to us, tit for tat. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, do you not know the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, as they have done for me, I will do to them tit for tat, tit Tony for tat Tony. Isn't this a sad scenario? This is great slaughter. 
that happens. We don't know how many were killed in that slaughter. And then uh, the Philistines go in to Judah. And Judah has been so reduced in their faith that they don't have God as a ruler anymore. They've probably lost their faith. And uh, they're saying, don't you know that the Philistines are ruler over us? Uh, They've just assumed that that's how life is. Dagon controls. Dagon provides. Dagon protects. Dagon has ultimate authority. Don't you know that, Samson? And Samson, he doesn't know that. He has an unshakable faith in God. And an unshakable faith in God will beat every confrontation against an idol God and a worldly philosophy. An unshakable faith. And that's what he has. And um, then what happens is... um, they bind him with two ropes, brand new ropes, these 3,000 uh, Judeans. And they hand Samson over to the Philistines. And the Philistines shout, oh, we got him, we have him. And he takes this fresh jawbone, again, a part of uh, the provision of the land. He takes this fresh jawbone and he kills a thousand Philistines. They don't capture him for nothing. And uh, one writer says, Samson comes up with a phrase, another, another ditty. He's, he's a literary guy. And it says, With the jawbone of an ass, I have piled them in a mass. With the jawbone of an ass, I have assailed assailants. And he does it because he's empowered by faith. And then after that, his uh, sexual desires come to the surface and he goes to, to Gaza. Gaza is a major city. And he's, he goes and he sees a prostitute. And he goes into her. It's interesting, at the first act, no one knew Samson. Samson walks into any town in the Philistine area and everybody knows who he is. And they know that he's with this prostitute. So all the leaders of the city come out And they say, Samson with the prostitute, let's wait for him when he comes out in front of the major gate where there's a plaza where all the business of the city goes on. We'll kill him. We'll kill him right at at, uh, at, uh, when 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 at dawn. We'll kill him right in the morning. Oh, it's a good plan. Well, I feel that Samson's nudged by the Holy Spirit and he he leaves at midnight. He goes to the plaza and he sees the gate and the gate's locked. Gate's a big thing. It has two big vertical posts. They're probably this big around. And there's a header, a post this big around. And he looks at that gate and he grabs it somehow and he just rips it right out. Rips the hinges out, rips the posts out. It's a huge job. It's probably... Four to 5,000 pounds at least, maybe more than that. Puts it on his shoulders, and he walks to the top of the mountain, it says. Well, the top of the mountain would be 40 miles away, and he could do that. But it, there's a hill called Hebron near Gaza that's two miles away, and he probably went there and walked and put that gate right at the, right at the bottom of the uh, top of the hill. Uh, that, that gate there in the picture is probably smaller than the one he lifted. I'm convinced. And um, what's the subliminal message here? Israel, you trust in Dagon, who has the gates, the gates that protect you. You, 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 you have the laws of the city uh, of the Philistines. They govern you. But one man filled with God can take the gate, which is the symbol of authority, and he can rip it out and take it so far away, it take a whole crew of men to put it back. You're trusting in the wrong God, Israel. 
Think about it. You think Dagon is the one who has the power and the authority? He doesn't have any of those things. It's Yahweh. Yahweh, you need to come back to him. And then that's the close of Act chapter, of, of the second act. And then we come to the third act. And the third act is uh, starts with another woman, Delilah. She must be pretty sharp. I don't know how Samson falls in love with her, but falls in love with her at the town of Sorek, smaller town, and they probably lived together for a while. And I imagine the sex is flowing. I imagine, and Samson is so infatuated and so in love, he loves her. Well, she doesn't love him for nothing. Uh, he's just a tool. Now the lords of, of the Philistines come. So you can see the advancement. No one knew uh, Samson at the f- first act. The whole town knows him at the second act. And now the lords of the Philistines show up at Delilah's house. And they say, we'll give you 11,000 pieces of silver each if you can tell us the strength of Samson. Uh, tell us, we need, to, we need to stop this guy. He's killing us. And Delilah's thinking, golly, if I can do this, I have financial security the rest of my life. I don't have to work anymore. She may be a prostitute. Who knows? I'm done with that if I can get 11,000 silver coins from each of the lords. We don't know how many lords there are, but imagine there's at least one lord for each city, and there's probably lords for prefects in Palestine. There's probably at least 10 lords. It's probably a boatload of money. And so she's, she's excited about finding out how he can... Uh, how she can find out this secret of his power. And so she's probably hugging him and kissing him and loving him and and doing everything that she can to get him to talk. And Samson, tell me how you're so strong. Verse 16, 7 says, well, you have to bind me with seven cords. That doesn't work. Samson snaps the cords as if they were lit in the fire like flax. Then she sa- he says, well, that didn't work. you got to bind me tightly with new ropes. Oh, that's a bad idea. He breaks the ropes as if they're toothpicks. Then, then he says to her, well, that, that wasn't it, but you got to weave my seven locks with a pin. So Samson's lying on the floor. There's this comb and there's... It's it's a structure that's hard to explain, but it's fastened to the floor, and they weave fabric into the hair. And he must be drunk or, or drugged because you're you're pulling on a guy's hair when you're doing this, you know. And he's just lying there, letting her her happen. And then he says, "The Philistines are upon you," and he just gets up and rips that thing right out of the pavement. Uh, that wasn't it. That didn't work. And finally, after all the nagging, and after all the whining, and after all the sex, and after all the cajoling, he goes, I've had enough. And he tells her, you got to cut my hair. And she knows that's the truth. She brings the lords back in. And uh, it's interesting. Samson always knew when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, but he doesn't know when the Spirit of the Lord leaves him. In fact, if you see in the slide, it says, uh, one Bible scholar said, Samson did recognize that his power came from God. His error was not a lack of faith in God's power, but rather his thinking that God's power would never leave him regardless of his conduct. And finally, God says, that's enough, and he leaves Samson. He can't fight anymore, and they jump on him, and they beat the living stuffing out of him, and they gouge out his eyes, and they put him in a dungeon in Gaza, a major city. And he's there grinding the corn 
Now you see Samson pictured in the fact that he's in this ox trough and he has this yoke on his shoulder and he's pushing this millstone around and the millstone is grinding the grain at the bottom of the stone. That's not true at all because Samson doesn't have any strength. He couldn't push that millstone if he, if he wanted to. It's a picture of a stone, probably has a, a hole in it. You put grain in it and you move it around like this all day long. What it is, is a picture that Dagon won. And now you're a slave. You're a slave of da Dagon now. You have no authority anymore, Samson. You have no power. You're out. We win. See ya. That's what's being said here. And theologians say that Samson had a come-to-Jesus time. He has a come-to-Jesus time in the dungeon grinding corn. And he probably does. And um, if you look at the target again, he probably, um, he probably has that core belief in God, and he's always had that. But he probably confesses and he says, my worldview has been off. Forgive me. Bring me back to that Judeo worldview. My values are all messed up. Forgive me. My behavior has not been correct. Forgive me. I mean, that could happen. And, and that's what we need to do, probably each and every day. I've been walking on a different street, and I need to change. And he has this time where he is by himself. He's lonely. He sees that there may be no way out of this, and he cries out to God. Now, because the Philistines are so happy that they've, they've captured this, um, this deliverer who has run havoc over their land, put themselves in economic ruin by burning their crops, those olive trees and those vineyards will take years to regrow. I mean, it's a financial disaster that happened to them. And they lost thousands of their own men. And so the, the, the commerce has been destroyed. The justice and the protection has been taken a hit. But now we have Samson in jail. Well, let's bring him up and have a party and put him in the middle of the temple and, and celebrate and celebrate to God Dagon because Dagon won. Let's do that. And so they do that and they have this temple and it's kind of hard to explain, but there's this plaza, I think, in front, an open space where people can mill around and they can sit. And then there's these two kind of archways, but they're kind of, they're balustrade. They, they are, are columns and, and you can walk under them, but they are covered. And so the cheap seats are up on the top. And so all the people that are in the community, they're standing up on the top. And they're looking down. And the lords and the dignitaries are under these uh, balcony canopy-like structures. And there's two pillars at, at one end and then a, oh, a big long way and then two pillars at another end. And, uh, and it's kind of in a V, I think. And, and they march Samson out. Can you hear? Can you hear the Philistines? Oh, look at you, you loser. You're trusting in Yahweh. You don't have any hope anymore. We're in control of you. And they're sliding him, and they're jeering him, and they're cussing at him, and they're flipping him off, and they're doing all those things that pagans do. They're taking their shoes off and throwing at him. And they're just having a great time. And they're amusing themselves and they're playing sport with him. And he's shuffling like a little old man he can't see. And he has a little boy next to him kind of leading him through the crowd. And, and, and he knows a little bit about the temple. And he tells the boy, put me next to the pillars so I can rest. And, and the, the little boy does. And Samson, he's not sure where he's at, but he feels both pillars and he cries out to God. And the text says that his hair grew, but I don't think that, that that's what gave him the strength. I think what gave him the strength was his faith. 
Dagon's not going to win this. I stand up for Jesus. I stand up for God. You can kill me, and I'm going to die for God because I'll never die for that uncircumcised false God. And he pushes those pillars with all of his might, and those balconies come down and crash and kill 3,000 more than ever, more than any of the people that he killed when he was living. And the subliminal message is, Israel, you can trust in Dagon, but he doesn't have ultimate authority of your life. You trust in him and you're going to go to hell. You only have to trust in Yahweh. You may die an earthly death. You may be jeered. You may be slaughtered. But in the end, you're going to rise again. And you're going to rise with Yahweh. And that's what Samson proclaims. And that's the message, the subliminal message. Yahweh's the provider. Yahweh's the protector and judge. Yahweh has ultimate authority and power. Don't ever think anybody else does. Because they don't. It's all about Yahweh. And Samson proclaims that an unshakable faith in Yahweh will carry you through every confrontation against idols, against the false worldview, against false behaviors and core values that are wrong. If you look at uh, the next slide, it has two stones. It has pure jade, which is very, very precious. It's the one on your left. And then there's another stone of jade. And jade has this uh, tendency to collect other minerals. And so the, the jade on the right is a hypocritical jade stone. It's, it's kind of like Samson. It's kind of like you and I are. And God wants us like this, the pure green. And, and, and I think Samson, when he, when he tore down the pillars, he was more pure green than he was anything else. Now if you look at the next slide, this is the jade, jade cabbage. This is a famous piece of work that was done by a Chinese man and this, uh, this jade cabbage is uh, in the Museum of Natural History and Art in Taiwan. And hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people go and, and see it. What's interesting is that the stone that was made or used to make the jade cabbage is considered junk. It's, it's, it's considered a stone that's compromised. It, it, the, the, you see the white and it has gray in the white? Well, that tells you that there's some type of pollution. Uh, inquinimento in Italiano, uh, some type of pollution or, or some type of toxicity in it that, which renders the stone really worthless and there, there was cracks in the stone and there were fissures in the stone and, and there, were, there were ugly stains in the stone and so forth but in that master's hand as he chisels away and puts things into view it comes out to be a beautiful picture and in the top of it is this, this green life and I think this is Samson as he's going through life and at the end that in the master's hand, with unshakable faith, uh, let's not criticize him so much. Let's lift him up. He's the only one that was worried to fight. And so an unshakable faith in Yahweh God will carry you through every confrontation against false gods, false worldview, everything else and will give you the ultimate victory in life. May we apply that.